This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on Insurance. I am an attorney retired from the active practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant, an insurance claims expert witness, an author and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to talk about arson as a peril covered by almost, if not every, first-party property insurance policy. Because arson is a fire, it is not an excluded peril in any first-party property policy of insurance. An arson is never a defense to an insurance claim alone. Only when arson is caused by the named insured or any insured is involved in causing the fire to occur for the purpose of defrauding an insurer, does arson coupled with fraud become a defense to a claim on an insurance policy? For example, in Eddie P. Bates v. Hartford, a 2011 decision from the Eastern District of Michigan, the insurer attempted to deny coverage by claiming that the fire was a vandalism. Since the house was vacant for more than 30 days, there was no coverage available under the policy. The insurer's effort to avoid payment was defeated because the insurer named vandalism and fire as separate perils, but did not as it did for vandalism, exclude fire after the dwelling was vacant for more than 30 days. As a result, the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan found that Plaintiff Eddie Bates was correct when he alleged that the defendant, the Hartford Insurance Company of the Midwest, breached the party's insurance contract when it wrongfully denied his request for payment under his fire insurance policy. Bates owned a residential rental property in Detroit, Michigan, that was damaged by a fire on June 17, 2008. Bates asserted that he did not learn about the fire loss until his return to the United States from vacation on June 23, 2008. He reported the fire loss to Hartford on the following day. Upon its receipt of the claim, Hartford sought a copy of the police report from the Detroit Police Department. Hartford claimed that the Bates house was vacant in the days which immediately preceded the fire, putting into issue an exclusion. Following the completion of its investigation, Hartford denied Bates' request for payment under the party's insurance contract. Bates, unhappy, of course, filed a lawsuit, and on November 1, 2010, Hartford sought summary judgment, contending the house had been vacant for more than 30 consecutive days prior to the onset of the fire, which in turn barred any payment due to the vacancy exclusion within the vandalism and malicious mischief provision of the insurance contract. Bates counterclaimed that the vacancy exclusion did not apply to an arson fire unless the insurer could prove that the insured set the fire to defraud the insurer. Since the insured was not in the country at the time of the fire, either there was no evidence and no evidence was produced that he was involved, the arson fire could not have been caused by Bates. The district court concluded that it is obliged to examine the contract as a whole, read the full policy, and give meaning to all its terms. Bates submitted that Hartford's vacancy defense failed for a variety of a variety of reasons which, in his opinion, are independently sufficient to defeat the pending motion for summary judgment. Bates' insurance policy covered damages that are caused by vandalism, 
but not if the subject property had been vacant for more than 30 days before the claimed loss. The policy stated, quote, Vandalism and malicious loss peril does not include loss to property on the described location if the dwelling has been vacant for more than 30 consecutive days immediately before the loss. Close quote. The district court, seeking assistance from the thorough analysis and decision by the Michigan Court of Appeals in Johnson v. State Farm, a 2008 decision to be persuasive. In Johnson, the insurer relied on its vacancy vandalism provision to deny coverage for losses that had been caused by an arson fire. Noting that the policy listed fire and vandalism and malicious mischief as separate perils, whereas the vacancy exclusion only mentioned vandalism and malicious mischief, the appellate court determined that arson is a specific kind of fire, as contrasted to a form of vandalism, and therefore it concluded that arson coverage is not precluded by the vandalism exclusion. As in Johnson, the policy at issue listed fire or lightning and vandalism and malicious mischief as separate insured perils. The structure of the particular policy provided an even more compelling reason to conclude that arson is not within the vandalism class of a loss. Although fire and lightning coverage is included in the basic policy, coverage for vandalism and malicious mischief was purchased separately by the insured with the payment of an additional premium. The basic policy excludes coverage for intentional losses, except that in the case of a fire loss, the exclusion does not apply to an insured who did not commit or direct the commission of any act which resulted in the loss of property interest by fire. Thus, arson is contemplated as a insured peril within the class of losses caused by fire, not vandalism. Furthermore, there is no vacancy provision anywhere in the policy except with respect to the vandalism and malicious mischief additional coverage. Construing the policy as suggested by the Hartford would require the appellate court to adopt what it called a nonsensical conclusion, namely that the policy provides coverage against arson fires in vacant properties unless an insured pays an extra premium to insure against the additional perils of vandalism and malicious mischief. Although Hartford could have included a vacancy provision with respect to fire losses in the policy, it did not do so. Hartford is not permitted to transform an exclusion from its vandalism coverage into an exclusion from its fire coverage. The court therefore concluded that the policy, when considered as a whole, is not ambiguous. Arson is not included within the vandalism and malicious mischief class of perils, and therefore the vacancy vandalism exclusion did not apply to Bates' claim. The motion for summary judgment for breach of contract was therefore granted in the favor of Mr. Bates. The case teaches that when asserting a policy defense, it is imperative that the insurer read all of the words of the policy and not read words into the policy that are not there. Although a vandal may, as part of his vandalism, cause a fire, the efficient proximate cause of the loss was fire. If the insurer wished to avoid losses by fire started by a vandal, it could and sh should be easy to write that exclusion into its policy. Hartford did not do so.
This video was adapted from a portion of my book, Zelma on Insurance Claims, Part 109, Second Edition, which is available as a Kindle book and or as a paperback from Amazon.com and is also available through my website, Zelma.com, by clicking on the link to the Insurance Claims Library. If you found this video to be useful, please report it to your colleagues so that they can view it, and subscribe to my blog so that you can learn of future videos and blog posts. Thank you for your attention.